footing for 223 and 556 spans pretty much everything from a close quarters AR-15 to a hunting rifle to a precision long range bolt action rifle and everything in between. But there are some very special considerations when you reload and shoot this cartridge and that's what we're going to cover in this video. Gavin Gay here from ultimatereloader.com. I am a huge fan of 223 slash 556 as a cartridge. I've had phenomenal results hunting, target shooting, close quarters shooting, long range shooting. No problem hitting steel at 650 yards and beyond. What a fun cartridge. It uses affordable factory ammunition. I know you guys are having trouble finding that right now, but it also is a source of a ton of confusion. My most popular video by far was the video where I break down the differences between 223 and 556. Remember, there's two important things going on here. There's the cartridges themselves, how they're specified by the military and by SAMI. But then there's also the firearms, specifically the chambers and the barrels and some of the subtle differences there that are really important. So I wanted to follow that up with a reloading video that breaks down all of the specific considerations for 223 and 556. We're gonna talk about what components are gonna work, what load data is gonna work. Other special things to know about like crimped primer pockets in your military 556 and sometimes 223 brass that you're gonna to have to account for. So we're gonna focus on all the specifics for 223 and 556 plus give a brief overview of a manual process with a single stage and manual equipment and then also a progressive reloading press. If you're cranking out massive quantities of ammo, you're gonna definitely wanna consider that type of a setup and a process illustrated end to end. So we're gonna start with a brief overview of the cartridges and the specifications. So let's first talk about 223, which is a civilian specification for this ammunition and 556, which is a military specification for this ammunition. 223 and 556, are nearly identical, but they are tested and the pressure is specified differently. The military uses EPVAT testing with a different pressure port location and SAMI testing uses its own pressure port and pressure specification. At the end of the day, the pressures that are allowable are very similar. The very important corner case that can become a safety issue is the base to ogive dimension that's allowed for 5.56 ammunition, specifically certain types of tracer ammunition is longer than what is allowed for 223 Remington. The 5.56 chamber also has relaxed dimensions and has twice the free bore compared to 223 Remington. As a general rule, it's safe to shoot 223 ammunition in a 5.56 chamber, but it's not necessarily safe to shoot 5.56 ammunition in a 223 chamber. There is a hybrid of the two, the 223 Wild, which is kind of a mix of the two, kind of a splitting of the differences for the chamber dimensions that will retain accuracy, but not cause issues with some of that corner case military 5.56 ammunition. For more information, I definitely recommend watching my complete breakdown of 223 versus 5.56. So let's talk about cartridge specifications. This time we're gonna focus on 223 Remington. You might have some slight differences with 5.56 NATO. The bullet diameter is 0.224 and that's consistent with all of the other popular 22 caliber center fire cartridges like 22 Nosler for instance or 224 Valkyrie. The case length is 1.760 inches, and the cartridge over our length is 2.260 inches. This is an important detail. You're gonna to wanna to stick to that 2.260, or slightly under in some cases, depending on the bullet that you're using, if you're feeding out of an AR-15 magazine. If you've got a bolt action rifle that's got a longer magazine, you might be able to load them a little bit longer. Just know that that ammunition is not gonna feed or chamber necessarily in a rifle that's gonna feed from an AR-15 style magazine or similar. Case capacity comes in at 28.8 grains of water. Rifling twist can vary between one and seven and one and 12 
depends on the type of rifle and the type of bullet you're shooting. Primers are small rifle or small rifle magnum, and maximum pressure as specified by SAMI is 55,000 PSI. Bullet weights will range from 35 grains on the light side to 90 grains on the absolute heavy side, with 55 grains being pretty much the sweet spot right in the middle. One of the first things you're going to need to look at and decide on when you go to specify your load data for 223 and 556 is what powder you're going to use. And I just had a great conversation with Justin, a ballistician at Hodgden, about the three different weight classes for bullets, light in the 40 range, uh, grains and then medium class bullets like 55 grainers and then heavy bullets like 80 grainers and specifically we talked about what are some of the powders that are going to work good there and in terms of burn rate and powder selection what's going to be the fastest and slowest for each and here's what he gave me as guidance so for in that lightweight range the performers are going to be accurate 2200 exterminator benchmark fastest would be IMR4198 and the slowest would be CFE223. In that sweet spot middle weight range of 55 grains, the performers are going to be CFE223, Varget, TAC, and Accurate2460. The fastest advised would be Accurate5744 and the slowest advised would be CFE223. And then in the heavy weight range, this can be a great performance category. 77 grain bullets for long range shooting are really a great selection for 223. The performers are going to be CFE 223, Varget, uh, Winchester Stayball 65, and IMR 8208 XBR. That is a fantastic powder for a lot of different cartridges. The fastest would be Hodgson H322, and the slowest would be Winchester Stayball 6.5. So when you go to pick load data, you're gonna probably wanna work up loads, you're gonna to wanna to validate the loads in the specific rifle, whether it be an AR-15 or a bolt rifle, or both, that you're gonna shoot that ammunition in. I definitely have scenarios where I like to shoot the same cartridge in both, my varmint ammunition being one particular case. Things can get confusing. The data is almost the same between 223 and 5.56, but is not quite the same. So it's important to know the differences. If you're looking at this data, the Hornady load manual, their, their handbook of cartridge reloading is the manual that I would suggest because they actually have data broken down by 223 Remington, 223 Remington service rifle, and 5.56 NATO. Different scenarios and different specifications things are really really close between 223 Remington and 5.56 NATO. I pulled a very specific set of data from the sections in this book to show you how close things are. So for CFE 223 and a 55 grain bullet, for 223 Remington, the max load is 27.4. The max load for 5.56 NATO is 27.5. That shows you just how close these cartridges are. Things are specified slightly different and they're measured and certified slightly different. Okay. And then from the Hodgden website, if you go to their resources section, they have reloading data for free for all of the powders uh, that they supply. What I found was for 35 grain bullets, 55 grain bullets, and 77 grain bullets, they have data for benchmark across the board. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at what the max load was and specifically what kind of velocities you can get. So starting with the 35 grain bullet, the maximum load is 27.2 grains, and that's a compressed load. You'll note a little C after the 27.2. That means the bullet is going to push the powder charge down slightly. Slight compressed loads are not typically a problem as long as you're not over pressure. And the velocity is 3,851 feet per second. That's knocking on the door of 4,000 feet per second. Really amazing performance. And then if we go up to a 55 grain bullet, we have a maximum load of 22.2 grains and a velocity of 3,066 feet per second. Pushing things up to a 77 grain bullet, we have a maximum load of 22.8 grains of benchmark and a velocity of 2763. So that's quite a different range, uh, quite a difference in speed, the velocity, ranging from 2763 on the low end to 3851 on the high end. It goes to show, especially with hand loading, just what you can accomplish with this cartridge. 
So along with selecting a powder, you're gonna to wanna to think about what bullet you're using, what the length is, the ballistic coefficient, a really important number to look at if you're looking at long distance shooting. Are there specific defensive characteristics or hunting characteristics that you're looking for? You're gonna find just about any bullet, ranging from 35 grains up to that 90 grains, a lot of different scenarios all in between. One specific thing to look at is whether or not the bullets are cannulared. Cannulared bullets have indentations all the way around the mid-length portion of the bullet there, and the case mouth is actually crimped up into the cannular, and it helps to secure the bullet a little bit, and that crimped case mouth can help feeding with a rifle like an AR-15. And finally, you're gonna to wanna to think about what primer to use. 223 and 556 use small rifle primers, and you can use either standard small rifle, match small rifle, or magnum small rifle. 556 ammunition typically specifies a magnum primer, 223 typically specifies a standard primer. The strength of the primer in terms of the burn magnum versus standard is yet another factor that you can use to control your standard deviation and the quality of the burn. If you have a heavy charge of a slow burning powder, a magnum primer might work better, but again, always check your load data to make sure that it's gonna be safe. So let me introduce you to the load that we're gonna be working with in this video. This is my standard 223 varmint round. It's got a lap hole case, it's got a Hornady 60 grain hollow point bullet, and it's got 24.0 grains of Varget and a standard small rifle primer from Federal. Yes, I will mix up some of the parameters for the load data, but this particular cartridge works really well on the rock chucks that I have around here, shoots reliably in the AR-15, shoots great out of bolt gun, and is just a great versatile load. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the entire process, start to finish. We're gonna illustrate some of that with a single stage gear, then we'll move over to the progressive to kick up our productivity level. If you're using previously fired cases, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is to clean those cases. You can use a dry tumbler, a wet tumbler, or even an ultrasonic cleaner. The important thing is to clean off the dirt and carbon so that you don't scratch your dies. After cleaning, it's a good idea to inspect your cases. Here we're looking for things like cracks along the side of the case, things like ripped up case rims. That can be problematic during the loading process and during the shooting process. If you have mixed head stamp brass, this might also be a good time to sort by head stamp. So now that we have cases that are cleaned and inspected, we know what we're dealing with, we're gonna take five of those cases and run them through the precision reloading process from start to finish. I've got my mech marksman here set up. It's got a KMS squared UFO press light on it. That makes it really easy to see what we're doing. I've also set up my sizer die. So we're just gonna go ahead and run each of the five cases through one by one. Now that we've sized and deprimed our cases, we're gonna do some inspection to see if there's any additional case prep that's necessary. We've got three different tools here. We've got zero to six inch digital calipers, and then I've also got a standard case gauge and a min chamber gauge or min dimension gauge from Wilson Tools and Gauges. So there's really three different things that we wanna take a look at. The first is, did we size the case enough? Is it sized properly? The diameter of the body of the case gets squished down just a little bit and the shoulder gets pushed back. And if we use a standard case gauge, we can drop that in. We look at the back face here. We can see if it falls between the two steps. With our min dimension gauge, we can, we can pop it in the back there and see if it's flush with the back. Now this is two different measurements here. Here we're looking at min and max and here we're just looking at min. If we have the case protruding from this gauge, it could potentially still chamber in a firearm with a generous chamber. This particular case gauge will check both. Then if we flip this over, we can check to see if our trim to length is correct. When we size the diameter down on a case, it squishes the brass and it gets a little bit longer. 
and after one firing that's probably not going to be a problem. If we take our digital calipers we can very easily see what our overall length of the case is and that's 1.7535 inches. We have a little bit of growth left until we get to that 1.760 inch length. So if we did need to trim then we would also want to chamfer the inside and outside of the case mouth. This case passes the check with the case gauge and we so we know we're sized properly we know we're within the window of our trimming a few different trimming options you can use a case prep center you can use rotary tools like the little crow gunworks has a great drill press or mill mounted trimmer lots of different options for that now we want to direct our attention to the primer pocket what we're going to look for is a little stamped ring on the back if it's military 556 it will be crimped a stamp comes down and then it squishes the brass in just a little bit around that primer pocket so that the primer can't back out. Well, the problem is if it's crimped we also can't put a primer back in. Multiple ways to handle that. The first would be a swaging tool either on the press like what's built into the Mark 7 presses or the Dillon RL 1100 or Super 1050 or we can use a bench mounted swaging tool. The swaging tool is just going to push a punch in there and push the brass back. We can also ream primer pockets with a case prep center or similar tool and that's going to cut a little chamfer and just ensure that that primer pocket is the correct dimension for the primer to go back in. Next we need to prime cases. This can be either done on press or off press. For the single stage reloading scenario I will show you some off press priming and when we get to the Dillon progressive press we will prime on press. Here I have the Competition Primer Seeder from Primal Rights. I'm just going to go ahead and prime each of these cases. And next, on to powder charging. Here I'm using a bench mounted powder measure. We could optionally use a trickler as well. If we did have the trickler, what we'd want to do is throw the charge slightly under and then use the trickler to trickle right up to that exact target value. I've got a combination pan and funnel here that I'm going to be using. Each time I throw the charge, bring the case up to the funnel and charge the case. and ready for bullet seating. Back over to the Mech Marksman. I've actually installed a Hornady lock and load quick change bushing system here so we could just rotate the die an eighth of a turn, grab our other die which I've already set up for bullet seating. Now some 223 bullet seeders can also apply a crimp, others require a separate die. We're not going to crimp on the single stage but we will when we get over to the progressive. So each time here we're just going to take a bullet, check our powder charge, place it on the case mouth, and then go ahead and seat the bullet. And done. So here's our five cartridges that we loaded on the single stage setup. One more thing we need to do, and this is something that you're going to do as a part of the cedar die setup, is look at our cartridge overall length. We have 2.210 inches. This is loaded a little bit shorter because of the short profile of that bullet. We're going to make sure that we're less than that 2.260. We can also use the Wilson min chamber or min dimension gauge. Those terms are used interchangeably. Just want to make sure that the tip of the bullet does not protrude from the gauge. So, I hope that broke things down into understandable, digestible steps, but that took a while. I think we should increase our productivity by working our way over to the Dillon 550 Progressive. What we have here is the Dillon RL550C. This is a manually indexing progressive reloading press. A progressive press will perform multiple 
operations simultaneously each time you pull the handle, whereas on a single stage press or on a turret, you're gonna pull the handle one time and do one operation and then either switch dies or index your head if it's a turret. This press is really nice because it is capable of some really fine precision in its ammunition reloading. It's very simple, it's relatively affordable when you look at progressives from cheap and expensive, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. So the dies as well are interchangeable between a single stage press and a progressive press and you can use the same dies for 5.56 as you would for 2.23 because the exterior cartridge dimensions are the same. So let me walk through the different stations that we've got going on here. Station number one is sizing and depriming. Station number two is powder charging. Station number three is bullet seating. And station number four is crimping. I've got a very, very slight crimp applied. When you don't have cannulared bullets, I don't have cannulared bolts here. You can put a very slight crimp on for a little bit of extra grip, a little extra consistency perhaps, that kind of thing. If we were gonna switch to cannulared bullets, I would crank that down so that we had the appropriate crimp into that cannular groove. Each time we pull the handle, we're gonna place a bullet in station number three. I'm gonna dwell at the top, waiting for the powder to fall, prime on the downstroke, and then index. And we've got that completed cartridge. Insert a case, new case in station number one, and repeat. Now I've also got the KMS squared UFO press light on this press, and with a cartridge like 223, this is very critical because it's very hard to peer down through those 22 cal case necks and to do a visual on your powder charger, which I can do by just looking in that direction, is, is going to definitely help us out and help us to be more safe. So this is great. Each pull of the handle gives us a cartridge. Takes a little while to get into the rhythm with the progressive. The press wants to go at a certain speed at each part of the indexing of the handle and the actuation of the handle. But once you get up to speed and you get into that rhythm, you can see how much more quick it is to load ammo on a progressive. And I would say for 223 and 556, it's definitely the most popular way to load that ammunition because if you're shooting 223 out of an AR-15, there's really no reason not to. It's going to give you plenty of precision. It's going to give you so much better efficiency. Well, there you go. Reloading 223 and 556 ammunition from start to finish. I hope this video was helpful to you. If it was, please hit that thumbs up button. Also, don't forget if you click on that link, the first one down in the video description, it will take you to the first article where I'll have everything written down, everything broken down section by section. I'll have links to product pages. That pretty much concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe with notifications because you're not gonna wanna miss the content I've got coming up. Also, links down in the video description. I'm on Patreon and I've got Ultimate Reloader shirts at the Ultimate Reloader store. Any support that you show is most appreciated. Thank you again for watching. Until next time, happy shooting and happy reloading.